focus. Okay. I did. Okay. Let's start up. Okay. Let's get started. So today's lecture is going to be about uh, chapter eight. And chapter eight is all about quantities and chemical reactions. So quantities in <coughs> chemical reactions. <coughs> okay, so um, a good example of a um, chemical reaction is something that affects climate change. So if, uh, if you believe what the politicians tell you, some of them will have you believe that climate change doesn't exist. It's, it's a scientific fact. There are things called uh, uh, greenhouse gases that uh, and one of the biggest green or one of the biggest culprits to uh, greenhouse gas contribution is carbon dioxide. We breathe out carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide is a naturally occurring uh, compound. However, with uh, the advent of the Industrial Revolution that took place in the late 1880s, okay, the, the Industrial Revolution introduced the usage of a lot of fossil fuels, and then later on the invention of the automobile. And we say we call them fossil fuels because really the, these are petroleum-based and um, hydrocarbon-based fuels that are derived from <coughs> ancient plants and ancient dinosaurs. Um, and that's where gasoline and that's where petroleum comes from. I'm going to show you the chemical reaction that contributes to uh, greenhouse gas uh, problems that we have here on Earth. But before I do that, if you look at your book, in figure 8.2, there's a chart in there that indicates uh, what's going on with this greenhouse gas situation. It starts at 1880, the, the, the x-axis is the year, it starts at 1880 and goes out to beyond 2000. Now that chart shows the, uh, in the y-axis, the part per million of, um, you know, greenhouse gases that exist in the atmosphere. And um, as you can see from the chart, greenhouse gases are going up. Actually, if you went beyond 1880, if you went much, much earlier than 1880, the, the, the chart of greenhouse gases, part per million in the, in the Earth's atmosphere, would be relatively flat. And it would be flat for literally millions of years. It was only until around 1880 that this started to spike up. Okay? So uh, figure 8.2 is all about global greenhouse gases. And they've risen. If you, if you look at the numbers and you can do the calculation from the chart, you can see that greenhouse gases have risen 38% since the 1880s. <coughs> so CO2, like I said, is a greenhouse gas. And uh, let's put the combustion of octane up on the board. This is the combustion of octane. Octane is the primary ingredient in, in gasoline. Okay. Um, and it's a hydrocarbon. So uh, we have uh, C8, H8, 18 actually. And it's a liquid. It's in the form of gasoline. Plus, and this is a balanced chemical equation. That's 25 right there. So we've got 25 O2s. So can, this is basically saying that uh, octane, which is a primary element, <coughs> primary component of um, gasoline, reacts with oxygen. Okay, 25 of these O2s, in fact. Okay. And you can see that that is a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions produce <coughs> CO2, and the CO2 is a gas. And in this case, it produces uh, H2O as well, okay, which is a gas. So carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay? So the main thing to take away from this chemical reaction for this chapter this chapter is all about quantities and chemical reactions, okay? Is that the combustion of octane, okay? Which is this right here, octane. We have two moles. Two moles of this stuff. Okay? 
two moles of octane. And then let's compare it to the greenhouse gas, the bad stuff, all right? The greenhouse gas is basically saying that there's 16 moles of this. <coughs> now, the numerical relationship between these chemical quantities uh, in a balanced chemical equation, okay, is a ratio. <coughs> so, we always maintain this ratio <coughs> that when I have two moles, if I have, if you could write it down as a ratio, if I have two moles of uh, C8H18, in this reaction I'm always going to have, I'm going to produce 16 moles of CO2. You always, always get this because this is the combustion of octane. Whenever I uh, have a combustion of octane, I get uh, carbon dioxide and I get H2O. But since this is a balanced equation, this is the coefficient of 2 here, this is the coefficient of 25, coefficient of 16, and coefficient of 18. It's a balanced chemical equation, okay? We get the ratio. We get the ratio that there's 2 moles of C8H18 for every 16 moles of CO2. And that's always constant, okay? So, once again, right, the numerical relationship between chemical quantities in a balanced chemical equation is called reaction stoichiometry, S-T-O-I-C-H-I-O-M-E-T-R-Y. You'll see that term stoichiometry over and over and over again if you take higher level chemistry courses. This is the first time you see it here. All right? So it's the numerical relationship between chemical quantities in a balanced chemical equation, and that's called stoichiometry. And this is your first example of stoichiometry. All it is, it's a ratio between the amounts of these different substances. And I just picked a specific chemical reaction as an example. Okay. Next section. <coughs> talk about next is the second section. And the second section, if you're following in your book, is about making pancakes. And it's the relationship between the ingredients. Okay. So calculating the CO2 that was produced in our combustion of fossil fuels, it's a lot like calculating uh, the, the amount of things that you need to make uh, pancakes. Um, for, you, know, you need a certain amount of eggs, you need a certain amount of flour, you need some baking powder. But the important thing is, is that all of those things are in very distinct ratios. So you could kind of write a, a, uh, an equation for the recipe for making pancakes. And it could go something like this. You could have one cup of flour, okay, plus two eggs, okay, plus a half a teaspoon of baking powder, And uh, when you combine all of these things, these could be like your reactants, if you will. When these things react, okay, they produce something. In this case, they produce five pancakes. So 
So you know that if you want to make five pancakes for breakfast, you need at least a cup of flour, you need at least two eggs, and a half a teaspoon of baking powder. And you might have some other things. This is a very simple example, right? But you know that the moral of the story is you know that you've got to check your refrigerator. Either that or somebody goes out to the store, right, and gets the flour or whatever they need to make sure that they have the right amount of materials to make the five pancakes, all right? <clears throat> well, the thing about this is that just like the chemical equation I showed you for combustion of a fossil fuel, there are ratios that have to hold, okay? In other words, when I'm making five pancakes, I know I need one cup of flour. What happens if I'm making 10 pancakes? How much flour do I need? I need two, two right? And all that is is, hey, you, that's easy, right? If I have 10 pancakes, I know I need two cups of flour. You multiply that by two. But I also need four eggs, right? And I also need a full teaspoon of, or a tablespoon of baking powder, right? So you multiply through by the ratio that you need. And that's exactly the same thing that you do in this chapter with the quantities and chemical reactions. So if you like making pancakes, you know, you'll, uh, you'll get this chapter, no problem. Okay, so enough about pancakes. Should have brought some of those in for it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Make probably would have burned them, though. <laughs> oh, there is a, there is a uh, remember I said that, there, burning of pancakes is a part of this uh, lecture, so, but uh, virtual burning of pancakes. In other words, you'll see, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Okay, this subsection is all about making molecules. So we're in chemistry now, right? We're going to make some uh, molecules. <clears throat> and we're going to deal with way to mole uh, conversions. Okay. So, um, Let's write down another chemical equation. It's fairly famous. Right? We have uh, 3H2 gas plus N2 gas produces uh, 2NH2 gas. Okay. That's a synthesis reaction, if you recall. Remember, in synthesis reaction, you have A and B produces A B, right? So synthesize, or it's also called combination reaction. Okay, but you always have these ratios. Okay, the ratios are always maintained. Okay, so for example, you've got three here. Okay, you've got an imaginary one here. Okay, you've got a two here, and those are the ratios that you're concerned about. Okay. So you, you know that if you've got three H2 molecules, um, the ratio says that you're always going to have one N2 molecule. The point is, is that this chemical reaction is full of ratios. Okay, That's one of them. The one N2 molecule is always uh, a ratio with the uh, two, oops, I meant to say NH3, okay? It's gonna be one N2 molecule for every two NH3 molecules. Now in chemistry, we don't count individual molecules, do we? It's gonna be a real pain, right, if you had to pick out individual molecules or individual atoms. So what do we typically use instead? Mm -hmm. We use a mole, right? So we're going to use, and the reason why we use a mole is because instead, instead of dealing with individual molecules, a mole gives us a convenient amount of that stuff to work with, right? So the ratio is still whole, okay? You, you can rewrite it like this. I have three H2, um, all right, I, rather I have this. I have, <coughs> I can write it like this, three moles of H2 is equivalent to one mole of N2, which is equivalent to two moles of NH3 for this reaction. And that's always, 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 always the case for this chemical reaction. Okay? 
So that's the whole idea behind Section 3, really, in a nutshell. These, uh, these coefficients come down to mole-to-mole -mole ratios. Now, you're going to use these, okay, so how do you bust these up? These come down to fractions. You can use them like this. You might find this useful, 3 moles of H2 for every 1 mole of N2, right, when you're calculating something. But don't forget, a conversion factor can be flipped around, okay? You could also write this. You could say 1 mole of N2 for every 3 moles of H2. And you got another one over here, right? You've got one mole of N2 for every two moles of NH3. And then I can flip this around as well, two moles of NH3 for every one mole of N2. And there's a third set of fractions. Do you see it? Where is the third set of fractions? I have a relationship between the moles of H2 and the moles of NH3, right? So my third set of <coughs> fractions is something like this. Three moles of H2 for every two moles of NH3. And I can always flip this as well. Two moles of NH3 for every uh, three moles of H2. So I've got three set of conversion factors that I can use. And that's bas basically what you're going to do when you manipulate the stuff in this chapter. That's all there is to it. <coughs> OK, let's move right along. move right along to subsection 4. Subsection 4 is uh, still about making molecules. But instead of <coughs> talking about, uh, you know, mole to mole uh, conversions, okay, we're going to talk about mass to mass conversions. Conversion factors involving mass to mass. <coughs> let's write up, uh, let's get that, um, that really bad chemical equation that has to do with greenhouse gases up on the board again. So we've got two uh, C8H18, which is liquid, plus 25 of those O2s. This is the same uh, chemical equation we started out with. We've talked about the production of uh, carbon dioxide from greenhouse gases. Okay. And that should be the same reaction. Okay. So now we're going to ask ourselves a question. All right. <clears throat> How much CO2 is emitted? upon combustion of a certain amount, let's say 5.0 times 10 to the 2 grams of pure octane. So you might want to be interested in how much of this carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere and polluting the atmosphere as a result of burning up so much octane. And uh, we're given a certain amount. <clears throat> and in, in these cases, we always write down what we're given. So what's the given going to be? Let me write, write that a little better. 25.0. Right, the given is 5.0. Times 10 to the second. Yep, grams. And that's of octane, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So C8. H18. What do we have to find? What's the thing that we have to find? How much carbon dioxide? Right. So when I say how much carbon dioxide, what do you think I'm going to find? Am I going to 
get the number of moles. Not really, this is a mass to mass conversion kind of problem, right? So when I deal with mass, what am I dealing with? It's grams. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the grams of CO2 emitted. That's basically the flavor of these kind of problems. All right? It comes down to conversion factors, okay? <clears throat> so the given is this guy right here. Uh, so let's rewrite it. 5.0 times 10 to the 2 grams of C8H18. 8, okay, now, what I want to do is I want to get the grams per mole of the uh, of this stuff, right? So how do I get the grams per mole of C8H18? That comes right off the periodic table, right? So what's the atomic weight of carbon? 12, and you round it, right? Or actually, in this case, yeah, we're going to round it. So 12.01, right? And how many of those carbons do I have? I got eight. So you're going to do eight times 12, whatever that is, plus the 18, because hydrogen has an atomic uh, weight of one apiece, right? I already did the math for you, okay? And you can check my work. It turns out that one mole of uh, octane, C8H18, okay, is going to have 1,100 and, I mean, well, 1,143 grams of C8H18. So that's the grams per mole of C8H18. Did you have a question? Okay. Now, I got to, okay, so that's good because uh, that gets me a little closer to my answer. This is the grams of uh, octane. This is the grams of octane. Now I'm left with the moles of C8H18. Okay. Here's where those ratios, those molar ratios, come into play. Can anybody guess what I'm going to write here? Well, what do you think is going to be in the denominator? What do you think I'm going to strategically put in the denominator? You're going to put moles of, of octane, right? Moles of C8, H18. But I need a ratio that relates the moles of octane to something else. What do you think that something else is going to be? What am I interested in? What do I have to find? Moles of O2? Well, yeah, I have, well, ultimately I have to find the grams of CO2. But before I get to the grams of CO2, it's, it's, it's good to get the moles of CO2, right? So I think that's what we want to do. We want to have a, a relationship between the moles of CO2 and the moles of octane, right? Yeah. This thing's supposed to be 114.3 grams. <coughs> oh, it is? 114.3? It could be. Yeah. Is that what you calculated? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, my mistake. That should be 114.3, okay? So, how do I get this relationship, the moles of octane and the moles of CO2? How do I do that? Well, we just look at the chemical equation, right? This is like making pancakes, right? You need so many eggs to make so many pancakes. Same idea, right? How many moles of octane do I need to have to make how many moles of CO2? Two. I need two moles of octane. But you can't forget what's in the numerator here. What do I have to put in the numerator? The 16. 16. Exactly. You have to maintain that ratio, right? 16 <laughs> moles of CO2. Not much different than making pancakes. All right? Am I done? Let's, well, let's see what the units give me so far. The moles of, C of octane and the, and the moles of octane cancel, and I'm left with the moles of CO2. Is that what I want to find? No, I want to find... Uh, how many grams of CO2 is emitted, okay? So now what am I going to do? Okay, yeah, let's do that, all right? Moles of CO2, and then grams of CO2. Just what she said. She said put moles at the bottom and grams at the top. Now where do you get that? Where do you get grams per mole? You always get it from the periodic table. Always, 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 right? You gotta combine whatever the grams per mole of carbon is and the grams per mole of oxygen, and voila, there you are, okay? 
Everybody understand how to do that? Look up the look up the grams per mole for carbon. How much is it? Twelve. Twelve. Yeah. Okay, and then look up the grams per mole of oxygen. How much is that? Sixteen grams per mole. Right. So what's the total going to be? Very good. Forty-four point zero one grams per mole. Okay. So forty-four point zero one grams of CO two for every mole of CO two. And the moles of CO2 cancel, and our answer is grams of CO2, and that's how you systematically do that. If you're interested in the final answer, it's going to be 1.5 times 10 to the 3 grams of CO2. We know scientific notation, we know that uh, we have 10 to the 3, so that's going to be what? It's going to be 1,500 grams, right? 1,500 grams of CO2. So think about that for a moment, okay? If I have, what's this? Uh, this is 5 times 10 to the 2. This is 500 grams. If I have 500 grams of octane, 500 grams of octane, that produces three times as much by weight of carbon dioxide, right? So every time you put in 500 grams of gasoline into your car, you're producing three times as much carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So why do they call it a greenhouse gas, okay? Because, have you, has, how many people have stepped into a greenhouse? It's hot. No? Nobody? It's really hot. It's really hot, right? That's where all the plants live, right? But there's a, there's a physical reason why it's hot. It's because even in the wintertime, right, the sun shines through. So one form of getting heat is radiation. So that radiation will shine right through the glass. And guess what happens? That heat gets trapped within the greenhouse, and especially if you close the door, right? And there's no ventilation. And it gets really hot really quick. In fact, there have been, unfortunately, there have been people who have died in greenhouses from uh, heat uh, exposure. But uh, plants love it. Plants love it. They love the heat and they love the humidity, right? Well, guess what, okay? The same thing can happen with the Earth. If the Earth's atmosphere has enough greenhouse gases in it, like CO2, there's a few other greenhouse gases, but let's just pick on CO2 because it's so prevalent and it's everywhere. If the Earth has enough of it, okay, the Earth will begin to heat up. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. And that's the reason why we have icebergs the size of Manhattan that are breaking off from the North Pole. And the last time that happened is we don't know the last time that happened. It's never never happened before, okay? So if anybody's telling you global warming is fiction, it's scientific fact, it really is, okay? And it's getting worse, it really is getting worse. Um, okay, enough of that. Let's go to the next section. Thank you.